You're watching Young and Profiting Podcast on YouTube. Before we get started, make sure you subscribe to this channel. And if you enjoyed the episode, please like and comment on this video to share your feedback. And lastly, click the bell button on the top right of this webpage so you'll be notified when we go live. Without further ado, here's episode number 47 with David Meltzer. You're listening to YAP, Young and Profiting Podcast, a place where you can listen, learn, and profit. I'm your host, Hala Taha, and today we have David Meltzer returning on the show. David is the co-founder and CEO of Sports One, a sport marketing firm which he co-founded with Hall of Fame quarterback Warren Moon. David is also the former CEO of the world's most notable sports agency, Lee Steinberg Sports and Entertainment. He's an award-winning humanitarian, an international keynote speaker, and a best-selling author. Since we last talked, David has come out with a new book called Game Time Decision Making that provides everything you need to know to up your decision-making game and build a championship-level business. In this episode, we'll uncover how to recruit a winning team, how to create the right mindset to make good decisions, and why milestones are better than concrete goals. Hey, David, welcome back to Young and Profiting Podcast. It's so great to have you back on the show. Oh, I'm so excited to be here and really appreciate the opportunity. Cool. So to recap for my listeners, the last time I interviewed you was for episode number 31 titled Goya, which stands for Get Off Your Ass. And we took a deep dive into your career and the lessons you learned from the mistakes you made early on in your career. And we also talked about the importance of minimizing ego and your secrets for attracting unlimited success and abundance. It was a super inspirational episode that so many listeners loved. So if you haven't heard it yet, go back and check it out. That's episode number 31. So David, we last talked about four months ago, and since then you've come out with a new book. It's called Game Time Decision Making. Could you just tell us about that new book? What was the motivation behind writing it? And who did you write it for? I wrote it under the disguise of sports and entertainment, you know, running the most notable sports agency in the world, having a global marketing agency that deals a lot in sports and entertainment. I felt that I had some tremendous lessons to teach people about being happy and I could utilize one of the most emotionally attractive things on earth, which is sports and entertainment. So what I did to carry on my mission of impacting over a billion people on earth to be happy is create a book about how do we make the ultimate and most important decision to be happy. And I did that utilizing a pregame analysis which is an analysis of, hey, here's a lesson that I'd like to teach you under the connotation of sports and then give the actual playbook to that success in the book, utilizing the biggest names in sports and entertainment and stories that I know. And then finally, a post-game analysis of that lesson. But the top mission of the book is to go through these lessons and stories in order to effectuate happiness. Yeah. And I personally read the book and I loved the way that you formatted it with the pregame analysis and the postgame wrap up. It was really easy to kind of understand what each crux of the chapter was about. So kudos to you. You start off the book with tips on how to build your roster or a powerful team of people that root for you. And from what I've seen on social media and things like that, you're really a master when it comes to relationships and with surrounding yourself with the right people. So starting off with the basics, can you explain why it's so important to have a good relationship with yourself first before you can really go ahead and have a good relationship with others? That's a fabulous question because I don't think people realize that they can't give what they don't have. And so it's so important to understand that we have to work on ourselves and introspectively look at our ego, our ego-based consciousness, as well as the truth and the truth-based consciousness. And so I still spend the majority of my time looking within whenever I see interference or corrosion to that which inspires me, any disconnect, separation that I have need to be offended and need to be right, separate, inferior, superior, angry, frustrated, anxious, whatever it may be. I immediately go backwards. I stop, drop, and roll inside myself and look to see what it is that is bothering me, raising my awareness so I can put the right intention and trajectory on what I want so that I can be happy. And so why do you think that building a strong team and being able to attract a strong team is a really big factor when it comes to your success? 
because I believe in vibration and I believe that we take on consciously, subconsciously and unconsciously the vibration of the thoughts that we have, the words that we take in, the actions that we do, the beliefs that we have. And if we surround ourselves with the right thoughts, beliefs, words, actions, then we're going to elevate our vibration. And we can only be aware of that which vibrates equal to or less than us. So I look for people that sit in a situation that I want to be in. I'm constantly aggregating and accumulating mentorship within my life so that I can learn the lessons in order to raise the vibration or frequency around me. So I listen to great things like your podcast, <laughs> Young and Profiting. I listen and watch the right TV shows. I also surround myself with the greatest people. If I want to write a book, I go to the Napoleon Hill Foundation to help me write a book. If I want to know about my relationship with money, I find a billionaire like Tillman Fertitta or Steve Wynn to help me with my relationship with money. If I'm looking for meditation or sleep, right, I go to Dr. Sangeeta Sahi in India or sleep, Dr. Mita Singh, who's the NFL sleep doctor. Whatever it is, I think people are doing themselves a disservice by not searching for the right people and right ideas to surround themselves with. Got it. So throughout your book, you have a really interesting concept, which you call relativity. Can you just explain the importance of this concept to my listeners when it comes to building a team? Yeah. So I believe that everything is relative to you. And when I first came upon this philosophy, it was difficult because I saw some horrendous things on YouTube concerning some true evil, I think. And I thought, man, how is that relative to me? I'm not connected to that. But it was relative to me because it was teaching me what not to do, what I don't want to attract, what I don't want to vote for in my life. So what I do is predetermine the relativity of who and what I want in my life. And so for me, my wife is most relative, then my children, then my mom, then my other siblings and relatives, then my local community, then my state, then my country, and then the world. And I actually put percentages in the distribution of what I have in order to allow everything to go through me to those that are most relative to me down to those least relative to me. But I'm always looking at the relativity and the impact that people have because I can have a greater influence on impacting others to impact others to impact others. And if I'm going to impact over a billion people in my life, I need to have ambassadors, people that will, at least a thousand of them that will impact a thousand to impact a thousand, a thousand times a thousands a million and a million times a thousands a billion. So I need to find those thousand and the lowest hanging fruit exists by those who are most relative to me. So I guess just to make it easier to understand for my listeners, like how does this relativity concept align with decision making? Like how do you use it to make better decisions? Well, you know, most people that make good decisions, they're value-based decisions. And so our values are our personal values, which are obviously related to those most relative to us. Their experiential values, which are once again related to those in the relativity chain. Then we have our giving values as well as our receiving values. And utilizing those values, we now apply those to the relativity of who we're talking to in order to effectuate the best decision, trying our best to stay out of scarcity or ego-based consciousness, trying to stay out of that everything happens to me like a victim or for me like a narcissist, but most importantly, through me for others. So if I'm making those decisions under the context of living in a world of more than enough and an abundant universe where everything comes through me for others, then I can make those decisions determined upon who is closest or most relative to me and my values. Got it. So let's talk about toxic relationships. Is it true that you only interact with people who have your best interests at heart? I, I try to interact with those who are aligned most with my values and have good thoughts for me. If I have to be around, which happens in you know business situations, family situations, someone that has a negative energy, attacking thoughts, judgments, or conditions that aren't aligned with my values, I have a simple philosophy and strategy of number one, seeking understanding of them and seeing if I can be of service or of value to them, and then also praying for their happiness. I do not create my own separation by creating an attacking thought or a defensive thought. By being defenseless, I become defenseless, meaning I actually become invulnerable by being completely vulnerable. 
And how do you let go of toxic people in your life without drama? Let's say like a family member or a friend that you grew up around. How do you let go of the relationship without it, you know, causing more drama than it should? So I try mostly, like I said, to understand that person and pray for their happiness and allow them to fall away. You know, life is like a trolley. People come on and off all the time and then they come back on. But most of the people in your life, if you don't give them energy, if you don't have attacking thoughts, if you seek understanding and pray for their happiness, they energetically will fall away. If you're still forced into that relationship, sometimes I need to articulate, and I've done this with certain friends of mine through the transformative years of energetic transformation that I went through that I actually had an in to indicate to some of my closest friends, hey, I don't like who I am when I'm around you. This has nothing to do with you, but I can't be your friend anymore. I don't like mm-hmm. who I am. And until I can resolve that, I hope you understand that I only pray for your happiness and well-being, but I cannot be your friend anymore. And they took it fine. They just said, okay, no problem, David. You know what? Ironically, they felt bad. So I think more than they took it fine, they apologized to me. And I think it elevated their awareness. My honesty, transparency, and vulnerability elevated their awareness to, I think, their own flaws and contribution to an unhealthy relationship that wasn't improving my life in any way and creating all types of ego-based and negative and scarce energy that they didn't want in their life either. And to this day, you know, some of those people that, you know, 11, 12 years ago that I had to divorce as friends still reach out and are praying for my well-being. I always say, you know, the people eventually they all applaud you you know they can laugh and scoff at you they can be angry and attacking but if you hold your course stay your frequency and seek the truth and pursue your potential sooner or later the truth will come out and people just can't help but applaud you yeah i've noticed that too it always starts out that way people are wondering why you're doing something or doubting you and then you know if you hold on and just work hard, it always ends up working out in your favor. There's one quote in your book that really resonated with me. It was, if it bleeds, kill it. If it grows, feed it. And I think this plays really well with everything that you're talking about and is a saying that we should all strive to live by. Yeah, I think it's really important to identify when people are leading you and that you have to be able to, you know, walk away from those that are taking from you. And then those who are watering you, feeding you, you know, nurturing you, you want to feed them. And I think it's a very simple philosophy to surround yourself with the right people, the right ideas, as well as to, you know, create a better acceleration and growth in your own life by being of service and elevating others that are elevating you. Totally. So you also mentioned the Ben Franklin effect quite often. It stems from a Ben Franklin quote from his autobiography, he that has done you a kindness will be more ready to do you another than he whom you yourself has obliged. What does that mean in your own words and why is it key to understand for healthy relationships? You know, for me, it's the cornerstone of the two most important questions that you need to ask in your life. And you need to ask these questions in person, on the phone, via email, and all media, radio, print, TV, and social media. You need to ask, number one, how you can be of service. You want to create a void, a shortage uh, on the side of the universe. You want to see, I use open and close-ended questions in order to effectuate seeing how I can provide value or be of service. But the critical question that most people don't ask and falls under, and that's the reverse Ben Franklin effect, is to offer your help. But the key question that radical humility is confused with, and I believe you have to be radical in your humility, you have to be completely humble person in order to ask for help. When you ask for help from someone, you become an investment of that person. And those people are going to want to help you and continue to help you. I'll give you a good example. When I was in college, I used to move up my syllabus one week and I'd go into my professor and I'd let them know my intention that I wanted to get an A in the course and I wanted to get straight A's because I wanted to go to the law school of my choice. And so I told them, would it be okay that I turned in my papers a week early and then get feedback on what improvements I could make to those papers? Well, by doing so, all the professors said yes. And by doing so, the professors on those assignments, I became an investment of theirs. So when they read my assignment, it wasn't reading mine, it was reading their investments. 
and of course they are going to treat their investments in the right manner comparatively to those people that may be bleeding them. That's really smart. <laughs> cool. So after we create the right team, the next thing you say to do is to create the right mindset and defend any negativity that comes our way. You say there are three minds with which we make our decisions, the conscious, subconscious, and unconscious. Could you break these down for us? Yeah, the conscious mind is the cellular structure that's the dumbest. It's the shortest term memory that we have. The conscious mind exists from the time we open our eyes till the time we close them. The conscious mind is subject to about 10,000 new data inputs, 10,000 things that we think, say, and do every day that are input into that cellular memory. That cellular memory gets those inputs from our five senses or even our six senses, if you believe that. But most importantly, it's understand that the key to the conscious mind is consistency. Determined upon your subconscious and your unconscious mind, it takes at least 21 days of consistent behavior in order for the stupid memory of the cellular structure to effectuate any type of growth or acceleration into the subconscious. Now the subconscious mind is what we believe. Subconscious mind holds 40,000 of the same thoughts every day. The subconscious mind are from the inputs of doing things consistently every day, creating neural pathways that create efficiencies, effectiveness, and statistical success in the mind that allow you to control the 40,000 of the same thoughts that you have every day, those beliefs. And that's why, to me, sleep is the number one habit that people should work on is because the conscious is not involved as much in sleep as the subconscious and unconscious. So if you want to develop yourself and accelerate and grow, you need to learn how to utilize those eight hours of the most consistent habit that human beings have on earth, which is sleep, which most people ignore their entire life. That's why mm -hmm. I have a sleep coach, a sleep mentor. I practice sleep. I study sleep. I spend a majority of my time every day making sure my subconscious mind, my beliefs are aligned with my values, my objectives, my attention, and my intention so that the coincidences in my life occur as I want them to. Coincidences are a mathematical term for two things happening at the right way at the perfect time. It's not an accident. Then finally, the unconscious mind is subject to the quantum memory. The quantum memory holds in our DNA. Doctors today will tell you four generations at minimum. Great grandparents, grandparents, your parents, and you. That quantum memory is a frequency that attracts, and that frequency has a strong signal, a spectrum of a signal, and the clarity of your message. No matter what you think, say, and do, and believe in the conscious and subconscious mind, the overriding power and most confusing power in our life is that quantum memory of our DNA. And we actually can shift that energy. We can bring healing to the epigenetic layer of that energy. We can activate and deactivate different memories within the quantum memory, within DNA, and all of this are being found out in scientific research today, but I know that the conscious, subconscious, and unconscious mind have a continuum from what we think, say, do, and believe into those unconscious competencies that expose themselves as our personality traits, our characteristics, our obsessions and addictions, what create a frequency to attract what we want. Meaning, no matter what we think, say, do, and believe, why some people get stuck, why some people end up in the same problems, the same relationships, the same shortages, voids, and obstacles that they always get, no matter what they do. I can't tell you how many people that I executive coach in my life that tell me, Dave, I think, say, and do all the right things. I don't know why this continually happens to me in business or in my personal life. And I said, because you haven't shifted your quantum memory. You haven't shifted your energy. You're sending the same frequency out and you're expecting the same result, a different result. Einstein nailed it when he said you could not solve a problem in the same consciousness in which you created it. What he was saying is you need to shift your energy. You need to shift what you think, say, do, believe, and your quantum memory, which includes that unconscious competency. Yeah. So there's a few things I want to kind of unpack. You just said a lot. So first, let's talk about sleep. What is your sleep routine like? What do you do to ensure that you use sleep to your best ability to ensure that you do have a positive unconscious competency? Sure. So, you know, number one, I use my sleep coach, my sleep mentor, Dr. Mita Singh, who's was also the coach for the Washington Nationals, who won four road games for the first time ever in the World Series. No accident. But Dr. Mead also is an NFL sleep coach that 
you know, coaches me and adapts what I'm doing to maximize when I'm in an adaptable routine of travel. So going to bed at the same time and waking up at the same time, being able to pass out. 64 is the best temperature for me. Having it completely dark, making sure that I'm not doing any distractive behaviors in my bed, studying, researching, arguing, any negative energy, that my bed is known and energetically holds a place to connect to and clear the connection to that which is most inspiring to have a direct subconscious and unconscious connection to the most powerful source of information energy and light and so utilizing a variety of mechanisms you know i just flew back from london on sunday landed went right to a speaking engagement with ed Milet in los angeles came home spent time with my family and once again passed out i usually pass out somewhere between nine p.m. and 11 p.m. Pacific time and I wake up every morning at 4 a.m. Pacific time and keep that routine. I eat at the exact same time every day no matter if I'm in California, New York, London, Portugal, Asia. My eating schedule, my body is a routine and I contribute Mm -hmm. to a consistent persistent pursuit of my potential which allows me to enjoy that consistent persistent pursuit much better because I live a healthy existence, a rested existence and an inspired existence and that means that we have cleared and uncorroded the connection to the biggest connection of inspiration that we have and when we live in pursuit and we live in inspiration so many things happen in our lives that just continually make us happier and happier. Yeah. And then so speaking of routine and habits, how can positive mantras help with shaping our unconscious? I think in your book, you call this leader's litany, which basically you say mantras and affirmations over and over again to start to shift your unconscious. Yeah. So I, you know, do many mantras, you know, that I always forgive myself is a big one, you know, that I love myself. I also use Cancel Clear Connect whenever any negative thoughts come to my mind. But the consistency of mantras every day, my gratitude mantra of saying thank you before I go to bed and when I wake up is just programming the conscious cellular structure in order to effectuate the unconscious, subconscious access that is given through the neural pathways of my mind in order to send a frequency and an alteration or a shift to my DNA or my quantum memory. And so I utilize that in order to effectuate what I think, say, do, believe, and the unconscious competencies changing my personality traits, characteristics, obsessions, and addictions. And now a short break from our sponsor, Skillshare. A lot of you young and profiters out there are entrepreneurs, side hustlers, or working professionals who want to learn new things, evolve, and grow your creative skills. Gaining a new skill or staying on the cutting edge of your field is easier said than done, especially for people like us who have super busy schedules and a lot going on. Well, I have some great news. Now you can build, fuel, and expand your creative fire with Skillshare an online learning community for the creator in all of us. They have thousands of classes that cover topics like graphic design, marketing, productivity, entrepreneurship, creative writing, and more. You name it, they've got it. And all their classes are on demand. So whether you want to take classes after work or on the weekend, you can totally learn at your own pace. And guess what? Our Yap listeners get two whole months of unlimited classes for free. Just head over to Skillshare.com slash Yap to redeem the offer. There's so many classes I'm looking forward to take now that I have two months of free access. I'm starting to get more into videos now that I've locked podcasting down. So I just signed up for do-it-yourself cinematography taught by film director Ryan Booth. And while I consider myself to be a seasoned marketer, I could always brush up on my skills. So I also registered for a class called Storytelling for Leaders. That way I can build a better brand and connect better with my audience. Skillshare is different than other online learning platforms I've used. For one, they have a focus on learning by doing. Every Skillshare class includes a project that lets you practice and get feedback. And their classes are taught by reputable industry leaders and you get to learn with others and collaborate with a growing community of over 7 million creators. So join the millions of students already learning on Skillshare and get two months free when you sign up at Skillshare.com slash yap. That's two whole months of unlimited access to thousands of classes for free. Get inspired, join a class, and create something you'll love. Get started today by heading over to Skillshare.com slash Y-A-P. That's Skillshare.com slash yap. I'll put the link in our show notes. 
Yeah. So can you explain to my listeners more about how this unconscious competency can play a big part in all of our in the moment or split second decision making? Sure. That's easy for you to say that unconscious competency. It only took me four years to get it right. So (laughs) (laughs) it's like truly a tongue twister. The way that the unconscious competency works is that through not only the consistent activity of thinking and saying and doing the same thing every day, but also accessing the subconscious. When we access the subconscious, so an example that I would use is if you're learning a language and you practice that language every day, pretty soon the unconscious takes over and you're not thinking about and you're speaking fluently to everyone. Anyone that's learned a language knows the difficulty of the transition from knowing consciously what to say to subconsciously having it in your database to having it as part of your unconscious competency. In fact, genetically, as people know, young people are easier exposed to learning Languages, a lot of that's because it already exists in their quantum memory. You know, if their great grandparents, grandparents, and parents have come over from Italy, they should have no problem picking up Italian. And so, what we want to do is get as much of the critical decision making, value based decision making into our quantum memory. Unfortunately, a lot of ego based decision making capabilities are in there based off of fear, separation, anxiety. And, you know, we have no power other than to shift that competency to end the, the chain of activity, you know, with abuse and addiction and, and other things that occur because it's in our quantum memory and we make the wrong decisions the same way that we can make the right decisions. So we have to practice ending fear, for example. We have to practice what we want to be. And that practice could be healing, love, honesty, integrity, whatever it may be. I always say the truth vibrates the fastest. So I am on the constant practice of ending fear of inspiring truth and to live as close as I can to the highest vibration that I can. I enjoy the consistent, everyday, persistent, without quit pursuit of my potential and prioritize what's most important to me by those values that I talked about earlier, my own personal values, experiential values, giving and receiving values. Hmm. Back to making good decisions. You say that meditation actually helps you to get centered and calm. Can you tell us about the type of meditation that you do to get in this state? Yeah. So I learned data meditation. It's quantum healing. I think meditation of any type is so important because we only get one action a day. Everything else is a reaction to that. What I mean by that is I utilize theta meditation to find my highest frequency on my first activity or action of a day and then use that as a baseline to know when I'm off of trajectory or creating resistance or interference or corroding my connection to that which inspires me. Meaning that if you can find your highest frequency of the day, and it doesn't have to be meditation, it can be walking, exercising, swimming, you know, having fun with your kids, whatever. But I use my first action of the day at the highest frequency to set a baseline so that as other ego-based occurrences in my life present themselves, I immediately stop, drop, and roll, go back to the highest frequency instead of getting on the slippery slope of ego that Mm -hmm. accelerates in the wrong direction. So how do you know what is your highest frequency? How do you find that? Well, through data meditation, I utilize vibration itself in seven different planes and visualization in order to determine. I can actually feel my body heat up. You know, I really believe that we can only be aware of that which vibrates equal to or less than us. You know, the earth vibrates the slowest, plants, animals, humans, sound, light, and then thought. The thing that vibrates the fastest is the truth. I want to be in the consistent, persistent pursuit of that truth of my potential. And so I utilize theta meditation in order to effectuate the highest frequency, which is a Mm -hmm. practice which I was trained in India from Dr. Sangeeta Sahi in order to utilize. But I will tell you that the layman's terms or the easiest way to know your highest frequency is what makes you feel the best. So you want to feel the best at the beginning of the day and you want to try to excel or achieve more than that, pursue your potential higher during the day. If you start off and you know you stub your toe in the morning and then you decide to get revenge on that by stubbing your other toe, you'll just continually go down the slippery slope of negativity. I work on the highest frequency and to improve and accelerate and grow as much as I can by learning lessons and trying my best to teach other people and inspire other people those lessons. 
Yeah. Theta meditation sounds a little intimidating and advanced. And in your book, you shared something that seemed pretty easy, a quick tip, if you will, called the six breaths of Buddha. Could you share that? Yeah, that's a a great tool to stop, drop and roll. So whenever I am aware that I'm an ego based consciousness, you know, the need to be right, offended, separate, resentful, angry, frustrated, anxious, etc. I always take the six breaths of Buddha. And what that means is I sit up straight with a very straight spine and I breathe deep through my nose and out through my mouth six times trying to clear my mind to connect or clear the connection to that which inspires me to raise my frequency to the highest vibration so that I can then move forward in the trajectory that I want to go, the one that accelerates, allows me to have exponential growth and really create productivity and efficiency as well as accessibility in my life. Cool. Well, if anybody out there is interested to learn more about meditation, I recently had Emily Fletcher, who is the founder of Ziva Meditation on my show, and we talked all about the science behind meditation, manifestation, and mindfulness, and all of the benefits around that. So if you're interested to learn more, check out episode number 46. So David, moving on, let's talk about mentoring and coaching. How do you feel those two things can improve our decision-making skills? Well, for me, I believe everyone should always have at minimum three mentors, uh, three coaches in their life, people who sit in the situation that they want to be in. There's no faster way in order to accelerate and grow or achieve your objectives than finding someone that's already done it. It's kind of like a nightstand at Ikea. You know, I would say if you buy two nightstands at Ikea, you know, the first one takes you for the other. The second one, since you've already done it, now takes you minimum half as much time. Why not find the person that's already built the nightstand and ask them how to do it and have them show you how to do it? So I literally prioritize the most important things in my life and then seek mentorship and coaching from those. I also believe in being a coach. I learn more from being one of the top executive coaches in the world. From what I do, I listen to the majority of my own coaching calls because I learn as much as they do. There's so many times as I'm on a coaching call that I'll say, man, that's really good advice. You should really take that, David. And I'm giving myself advice. Uh, <laughs> so I, I think if anything's going to change your life more than just asking for help, it's who you ask for help from. So, you know, the takeaways from this, you should definitely not only ask for help, but find the right people that sit in the situation you want to be in to help you. Do you have advice for people who, you know, they reach out to folks, even people reach out to me for 30 minutes of my time, and I'm unable to do that all the time. Do you have advice for people to effectively find a mentor? Well, the first thing is just having the humility to ask. And the second is to understand the critical business issues or life issues of the person that you're asking. Most people don't have 30 minutes to help. And you're very gracious for giving that. You know, I have a 520 rule. I'll get on the phone with anyone for five minutes and my meetings are 20 minutes. My interviews are normally 20 minutes. I make exceptions, of course, but most of the time that's what I give. And I try to stay as focused and as efficient and as effective and statistically successful as I can during that five minutes or 20. I learned from Bob Proctor, one of my mentors, that, you know, after five minutes on the phone, you're just visiting. You know, after 20 minutes Mm -hmm. in a meeting, you're just visiting. So, you know, the best way to ask is to have the humility to find the right person and find the right situation, volunteer for their organization or meet them in a non intrusive manner and ask for help. When I asked Steve Wynn to help me with my relationship with money, I just met him at dinner with a friend and I simply said, hey, would it be okay if I gave you a call sometimes? I'll be very concise and very quick, but I'm so curious about your relationship with money and I'd love to be able to call you for a minute or two with a situation that I'm in to see how you would handle it energetically and logically about your relationship to money. Does that sound fair? And, you know, within minutes of meeting him, not only was he impressed with me asking, but he gave me a cell phone and, you know, I've utilized it three or four times in my life and only taken less than 10 minutes of his time. I still today utilize that by asking, you know, different mentors from TV, movie, business, finance, real estate, whatever it is to find the best people on earth. And I'm always very conscious of where they are non-intrusively asking them for their appropriate amount of time and Mm -hmm. knowing specifically what I'm looking for. 
Yeah. And I think another good point to mention is internships and working for free. So for example, I have this podcast, I have three new interns and, you know, I put out a solicit to get new interns for my podcast where basically I would be, you know, bringing them under my wing. They'd learn everything about podcasting, you know, like 30 people applied, but I'll say maybe, you know, 30 people a day reach out to me for advice on podcasting. So it's just funny. Like people also need to realize that, you know, you need to give to get. So if you're interested in learning from someone, look for opportunities like internships. Yeah, or a variety of opportunities where you can be of service, volunteer for charities, you know, look for all types of different teaching and mentoring opportunities for yourselves. You know, there's so many times that the people that are offering their service and and giving value to others, all of a sudden someone higher up or in charge notices and offers their help to that person. So I would look to be of service to provide value. Internships is a fabulous way to do that. We have a huge internship program that is stemmed from Lee Steinberg, my sports agency days, you know, for the last 15 years where we've had thousands of kids who have now been placed in multiple places and have doing exceptional things. I put that under the guise of being kind to your future self. Totally. So let's move on to forgiveness. Why do you think that forgiveness is one of the best ways to foster personal and professional growth? It's so interesting because, you know, we can't give what we don't have. And what most people don't understand is what separates us most is judgments and conditions. The minute we start making judgments and conditions on matters, it separates us. And those are very personal. They're personal to our own perspective. And so forgiveness, the more we carry forgiveness, the more peace that we'll have, the less resistance we'll have, the less interference and corrosion to the inspiration that we'll have. And forgiveness to me is a, a weapon. You know, it really is a weapon against interference and corrosion to inspiration. It's a weapon against judgments and conditions. Forgiveness is radical humility. And so I seek to be wise enough and elevated enough to forgive all situations, to carry no judgments or conditions, but simply to consistently, persistently pursue my potential and enjoy that at the highest frequency. And it's not easy. I'm The things that I teach and the things that I do, it's just what amount of time am I doing this? And I still find myself every day forgetting lessons that I've learned, forgetting lessons that I teach. But I know I have the power and I empower others to access those lessons and relearn them and execute on them as much as I forget them as well. I mean, from gratitude to forgiveness to accountability to inspiration, every single day I teach, preach, and help people with those four things. But every single day I also forget them. There's multiple times during the day that I lose my forgiveness, that I lose my gratitude and accountability And I just try to decrease the amount of time that it takes to get back to center and find that gratitude, forgiveness, accountability, and inspiration. Yeah. So something that relates to this is this phrase that you use pretty often throughout the book. It's called majesty of calmness. (laughs) And to me, the gist of it is that you should not try to have emotions that change from way up to way down. And when things happen to you, good or bad, you shouldn't get on the extremes, either too happy or too sad. You should just try to strive for consistency and calmness. And you also mentioned several times throughout this interview to be in the consistent, persistent enjoyment of the pursuit of your potential. So tell us about why you believe this to be, you know, so powerful. Why do you believe that you have to just kind of be calm and enjoy the pursuit rather than the outcome? Yeah, you know, just the word pursuit is inspiring, you know, to be in the pursuit of something and to enjoy the pursuit is, you know, really the key to life. And to most enjoy or maximize our potential, we need to be at center. And the idea of being at the majesty of calmness is that we can be at the highest attention with the clearest intention that allows us to create the coincidences or the coinciding of what we want to occur. And that's what creates true abundance. That's what creates true happiness as well. And so I really try to inspire others and teach other people of 
where their highest frequency is, where their center is, how to find that center, how to think or make decisions within the majesty of calmness, within the truth consciousness, not the ego-based consciousness, not the one that has interference or corrosion to inspiration, but that which is most inspired. It takes one little particle of light to overcome millions of particles of darkness. And we waste so much time, energy, and emotion, both on the positive and on the negative side. I teach my own children to remove themselves from the good opinions of others as much as the bad opinion, right? I don't want them to have the judgments and conditions and interference. I want them to live in the majesty of calmness and just enjoy the pursuit of their potential, of what they want at their highest frequency and potential. Yeah. So I think the key to this is to not attach your happiness to outcomes, right? Yeah. How do you suggest that we, you know, plan when it comes to our goals? Yeah. So that's the most conflictual thing. And a very common question is, okay, so if you think you have to detach your emotions or happiness from an outcome, how do you have goals or objectives? Well, because I have key goals and objectives every single day and I determine them those by the importance of my values of that day. But I pursue them and enjoy the pursuit of that goal. So I don't put limitations on myself. A goal may be, you know, I want to make over a billion dollars as fast as I can, not I want to make a million dollars by the end of this week. One creates limitations, resistance. The other is completely abundance. Now, once I set an objective of making over a billion dollars as fast as I can, my next pursuit is to enjoy the consistent everyday persistent without quit pursuit of my potential of doing that to achieve making over a billion dollars as fast as I can completely different than someone that says I will be so happy when I make a billion dollars and 99% of the people on earth they're the lottery ticket the resistant creating the obstacles void shortages and scarcity creating I want to make a million dollars by the end of this week or I need to make a hundred thousand by the March or I got to make a billion dollars by the end of this year and my happiness you know I'll be happy when I graduate law school I'll be happy when I have my first child when I get married happiness will never come but if you enjoy the consistent persistent pursuit of your potential of all of those things you'll be happy all the time. And ironically, those things will come more accurately and rapidly than you can imagine. Yeah. I want my listeners to really understand this. And I think a good way is by a real example. So you had recently, you threw 50 birthday parties for your 50th birthday to raise money for charity, correct? Correct. Can you just explain like what your goal was with that and how you positioned that goal in your mind? Yeah. So, you know, what really inspired me first was I wanted to teach and impact the world that money is very important, that it's an energy or a currency that you put into the flow, but money doesn't buy happiness. But what money and why money is so important is it allows you to shop. And I wanted to show people and give them an opportunity to shop for the right things. And I wanted to use my birthday as a platform in order to raise the awareness and intention of teaching people to shop for the right thing. So I wanted to impact the world by creating community centers in Africa. I was a chairman of Unstoppable Foundation. I still am and built some villages and we've impacted thousands and thousands of people, mostly young women who in the ninth grade were forced to get married to 40 year olds and get circumcised and just awful things and not educated. We built schools and clean water and healthcare. But now that we've done, you know, 17 communities, I felt that we needed to connect the generational situational knowledge of the parents and the grandparents to this newly educated college and high school graduates and these educated women and young men in a new generation. We needed to fold in the experiential knowledge and situational knowledge of those elders. And so I wanted to build these community centers and I used my birthday and every week had a different birthday party around the world where instead of receiving gifts, I'd given people the opportunity to give. I gave them the gift of giving, the opportunity to empower others, to empower others, to learn about how to shop for the right things. And I will tell you, we built two community centers through my birthdays and I have never shopped for or been more happy with what I was shopping for. And I hadn't enjoyed, you know, my pursuit of that potential more than my 50th birthday parties. And what was your goal? Like how much money were you planning on raising for that? Over a million dollars. And why were you so keen on saying over a million dollars and not a million dollars? 
Yeah, so a million dollars would have bought one community center. And I just know that I wanted at, you know, minimum one community center, but I know the universe is abundant that has more of everything for everyone. So we raised much, much more and we're able to do much, much more. And I think that we would have been limited if we put a million dollars and most likely probably wouldn't have even hit it. But when we talk about more than a million dollars and we focus in on the purpose and the potential of the community centers of impacting thousands and thousands of people generationally, <laughs> impacting and consistently creating an annuity of love and education and health and all these other things that we're able to do, people were inspired. And that inspiration allowed us to create abundance and create less shortages, voids, and obstacles and, you know, achieve twice as much as what my objective was. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. So you also suggest that in order to remain consistent, we should often lower the bar. And, you know, it's very counterintuitive to what most people tell us our whole lives to raise the bar. Why do you take that approach? And can you explain that? Yeah. So the word consistency is why I take that approach. And, you know, to give you an example, as your listeners might like, is, you know, so many times people, they want to go work out and what they do is they go out that first day and they run 10 miles or they lift really heavy weights and then they get so sore and tired, they stop. I believe that consistent behavior is what creates habits. It takes 21 days of doing something minimum, depending on your subconscious and unconscious competencies, of getting something into your neural pathways. So if I, and this is true, when I decided to get back into shape and to prioritize my health first, because my wife told me, as I asked her what she wanted, anything in the world, she told me to take care of myself because I would take care of others if I took care of myself. My first day lowered the bar and said, I'm going to put my tennis shoes on. And that was all I was going to do. Now, meanwhile, I ended up putting all my clothes on, going to the gym and spending 15 minutes on the elliptical trainer. But I lowered the bar every day so that I would work out every day. And sure enough, somewhere between 21 and 30 days, instead of waking up in my body, mind and soul telling me I don't want to work out, my body, mind and soul for the last you know, two and a half years has told me you have to work out. And if I don't spend a minimum of an hour a day on my health, I feel like there's something missing because it's intuitive within the unconscious competency and subconscious that I have beyond my conscious mind. And so we all have been there. I just think it's important that we lower the bar to create consistent behavior first. We can always build up to those bigger goals. Acceleration and growth, time is your friend. You have an infinity of time. Things will happen faster when you don't put a time restraint or a limitation or a methodology of a number on what you do. The universe, I don't believe, believes or understands those numbers. It only understands mm -hmm. infinity of time and space. That's really interesting. So I want to be respectful of your time. We're just about out of time. I have a new tradition where I ask all my guests the same question. We are the Young and Profiting Podcast. So I want to know, what is your secret for profiting in life? Yeah. <laughs> My, my secret for profiting in life is to give quantitative value. I think too many people focus in on subjective value. There is subjective value in everything, uh, especially when it comes to profit. I am determined when I provide value and I'm of service to be a profit center. I'm very profit oriented and quantitative value is the key to profitability. And so that my relationships, my businesses, my strategies are not about giving hugs to people. It's about profit. I know that I can't give what I don't have and that money allows me to shop. And if I shop for the right things, I'm going to be happy. And if I shop for the wrong things, I'm not going to be happy. But I need to profit and teach other people to profit. Even with my executive coaching, I guarantee profit. I am all about quantitative value. So if you want to profit, then get into the realm of math and start challenging yourself in order to make more money, to help more people and have more fun. So do the math, create quantitative value and ask for quantitative results. Awesome. And where can our listeners go to find more about you and everything that you do? Just remember my name, David Meltzer, not Dave Meltzer, you'll get the wrestler. David <laughs> Meltzer, at David Meltzer on Instagram, David Meltzer on LinkedIn, YouTube. And my website is my first initial last name, dmeltzer.com. But if you search David Meltzer, you will find me. Awesome, David. It was such a pleasure as always. Oh, you're so kind. And I really enjoy your show and I appreciate what you do for everyone. So, you know, keep on profiting. Take care. Thank you. 
Thanks for listening to Young and Profiting Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to leave us a review or comment on your favorite platform. Follow Yap on Instagram at Young and Profiting and check us out at youngandprofiting.com. And now you can chat live with us every single day on Yap Society on Slack. Check out our show notes or youngandprofiting.com for the registration link. And if you're already active on Yap Society, share the wealth and invite your friends. You can find me on Instagram at Yap with Hala or LinkedIn. Just search for my name, Hala Taha. Big thanks to the Yap team as always. Stay blessed and I'll catch you next time. This is Hala signing off.